Sometime after I did my rabies video, I went off looking for the next pathogen to cover. I thought, should I do another bacteria? Eh, might be too soon after I just did tuberculosis. Another virus wouldn't do either, not after rabies. What about a eukaryote? Like a protozoa or a worm or something? I could, but none of them stood out to me at the time. Then, out of the blue I thought, hey, I wonder if there's an Archaean pathogen I could talk about. Yeah, Archaea, the often forgotten third domain of life. Our collective cousins. These single-celled living relics are most famous for members that not only tolerate extreme conditions, but thrive in them. I wonder if any of them cause disease. So I loaded up my trusty Google Scholar and found... nothing. Couldn't find a single Archaean pathogen. And so I did what any sufficiently passionate biologist YouTuber would do, and... I closed the page and pushed this far back into my nucleus and tried to ignore this inconvenient and mind-shattering realization. Think about it. There are three domains of life. Bacteria, Eukarya, and Archaea. And so think about the incomprehensible complexity of Bacteria and Eukarya and understand that the diversity in Archaea could potentially put both of those domains to shame, and yet, to this day, we still can't find a single one of these guys that causes disease. Allow me to spell it out for you. Viruses can unalive you. Bacteria can unalive you. Fungi can unalive you. Plants can unalive you. Animals can unalive you. We live in a world full of potential danger, surrounded by organisms that, in the struggle for life, evolved various ways to hurt other organisms. But the mysterious third domain of life maybe never did? At least in humans. What? What are the chances? Let me outline exactly why this caused my nucleus to decompress. One, Archaea are literally everywhere. They are plentiful in the environment. The chance that you encounter Archaea in your day-to-day -day life is 100%. 2. Archaea live on and inside of you. They make up a part of your microbiome. They have access to the warm, comfortable environment known as your body. Remember those toxins from the bacteria addiction video? Archaea can make toxic molecules too, although for some reason this hasn't been sufficient for any Archaea to actually cause disease. So why in the ever-loving heck did bacteria seemingly never cross over to the dark side? Do I know whether there are any Archaean pathogens? No. What I could find from the literature is more accurately stated as, so far, to my knowledge, no Archaean pathogens have been found. There are broadly two potential explanations for this. One, there are truly no Archaean pathogens. And two, Archaean pathogens are hard to find. We have to acknowledge here that Archaea, despite being, you know, a third of the domains of life, are understudied. You could argue that's partly because they don't really cause disease, and so governmental funding into Archaean research is likely a bit light. But there's another dimension to this difficulty, and that's because Archaea are freaky, weird little guys. To appreciate why we know so little about Archaea, we need to first learn about their evolutionary history. The Archaean claim to fame is that they can be found in extreme environments, and it's what people love about them the most. The story behind how they evolved to fit in this niche is actually tragic. One hypothesis for how Archaea came to be is that when they were still one and the same as bacteria, a subset of those bacteria dropped out of the microbial rat race. See, while the majority of the bacterial domain do not cause disease in humans, these little buggers are actually potentially vicious to their microbial neighbors. Some of the most potent antibiotics that we know of have been isolated from microbes. Streptomycin comes from streptococcus. Penicillin comes from mold. Hell, even your brewer's yeast secretes ethanol, which other microbes do not tolerate well. One hypothesis as to how Archaea evolved to thrive in these extreme environments is that they moved to unexplored niches with very little competition and could get away from the microbial warfare. Here's where I have to be careful about propagating common myths, though. While this story makes a whole lot of sense, unfortunately, I did find more than a few antibiotic evolution people who claim that this story is unsupported by data. While we harvest these bioactive molecules from microbes, we don't really know why these microbes evolved to spit these molecules out to begin with. It makes sense that it gives them a competitive advantage, but that's just a hypothesis. These antibiotics could have other yet-to-be-discovered functions. It's a microbial world, and we're just living out of it. 
Regardless of the validity of their tragic origin story, Archaea remain difficult to study because of their restrictive environment. While your run-of-the-mill E. coli can be cultured at either your cozy body temperature or even at room temperature, culturing some Archaea can be a nightmare. While we might marvel at thermophilic Archaea and their ability to thrive at near boiling temperatures, they likewise look at us, amazed that we can survive in such frigid cold. Many Archaea need extremely specific and difficult to reproduce conditions to grow, some of them may even need a complex community of other microbes to survive. How do we study Archaea if we can't even get a lot of them to grow in the lab? A lot of what we know about Archaea comes down to finding their DNA in samples. So the fact that we haven't found an Archaean pathogen could be due to Archaea being ridiculously difficult to study. But I don't think that that's necessarily true. Because when scientists study disease, they don't typically go out looking for new bacteria and backtracking to find whether they cause disease. They start from the person with the disease. And many infectious diseases have already had their origins discovered. With that in mind, we're finally ready to talk about the various theories scientists have with regards to this glaring omission in the pathogen party. This is such a bizarre thing to observe that the answer to this conundrum is going to have to be equally bizarre. About 20 years ago, scientists hypothesized that the lack of an arcane pathogen could be due to their different nutritional requirements. At first, I thought this to be kind of funny. How different could archaean metabolism be to actually warrant never adapting a pathogenic lifestyle? But I learned that yes, archaea do require a different nutritional profile to bacteria or eukaryotes. And this explanation would have been pretty good if we didn't find out that archaea do hang out in our body. So either their nutritional requirements aren't as strict as we once thought they were, or they're able to somehow make their requirements on their own. So what's left? The only other hypothesis I found was what I will call the archaean virus hypothesis. This paper hypothesizes that the reason Archaea never evolved to be pathogenic was because Archaea are just too freaking weird. Let me explain. One prevalent way bacteria become pathogenic is by being infected by phage, viruses that specifically infect bacteria. The vast majority of bacteria don't actually cause disease. A switch to a pathogenic lifestyle for at least a couple of bacteria can be attributed to infection by phage. One of the most famous examples of this comes from our friendly microbial resident, E. coli. E. coli, for all the bad press they get in the media, are actually a part of our normal healthy microbiome. They hang out in our gut, making vitamin K and consuming oxygen to help their anaerobic friends that would die in the presence of this molecule. They're ideal, perfect neighbors, but they can flip to a pathogenic lifestyle upon picking up genetic virulence factors. There are strains of E. coli with viral phage DNA integrated into their bacterial genome that code for the Shiga toxin. This toxin is bad news and is responsible for much of E. coli's harrowing reputation. Shiga toxin attacks the epithelium, shutting down protein synthesis and killing cells. The body responds by evacuating the threat, returning pathogenic E. coli back into the environment. E. coli itself would have probably rather stayed in our warm, cozy bodies, but upon taking up this genetic material has been switched to a different lifestyle altogether. Kind of messed up, honestly. So, in a way, pathogenic phage just used bacteria to infect us, their eukaryotic hosts. The bacteria itself might just be a middleman. Even though archaea and bacteria are, on the surface, so similar we consider them to be one and the same at some point, pathogenizing bacteriophage do not infect archaea. At all. We worry all the time about viruses jumping from species to species, and yet these two little water bags are different enough from one another that their viruses appear to be completely exclusionary. So freaking weird, I'm freaking out here. So the authors of this paper surmise that one reason why Archaea never made the switch to pathogenicity is because they were never infected by viruses that make bacteria cause disease. But that leaves us with an important obvious follow-up question. If viral infection is important for the switch to a pathogenic lifestyle, why don't archaean viruses do the same? The authors of this paper argue that it's dumb luck, and I freaking hate it. I hate it because I don't have a better answer. Their argument is that viruses first have to evolve to infect their intermediary host species like bacteria, which is already tricky to do. Then, to cause disease, these viruses have to get extremely lucky again to also evolve to adapt to their eukaryotic host. This argument makes my nucleus itchy. It's not satisfying. But I mean, maybe it's not all that far off from the truth. Who knows what the actual proportion of microbiome residents are archaea? 
maybe there aren't just enough that are in contact with eukaryotes for evolutionary lightning to strike twice. Here I do have to acknowledge, before signing off on this video, that archaea have been associated with dental disease. Scientists have found that higher populations of methanogenic archaea were associated with worse dental outcomes. But we don't know whether these archaea are just taking advantage of a compromised oral environment, or whether they themselves are driving dental disease. We just don't know. We know so much about so many different bacteria, it feels insane how little we know about archaea, given how similar they appear to be. And if you're feeling the same frustration, welcome to science. There will never be a shortage of incredibly interesting stories to uncover. I just hope I get to live to see this answer. There's quite a bit more about archaea that I couldn't fit into this story. The extra stuff will be in the next 5-bit 